I try to speak not too fast in English. Everybody can understand English? Yes? yes. Uh, my first language is French, but I think it doesn't help. Right? <laughs> French does not help. <laughs> okay, so we go in English. Okay, so uh, you can see the title over here. The, uh, what I'm going to present, we are the only uh, group in the world doing that. So all the technology has been developed uh, in this uh, nanorobotics lab, and we started out 14 years ago. Uh, when I moved after 10 years at MIT, moved to uh, Canada, so I got the, uh, an offer there to start the uh, lab. And they want to name a nanorobotics lab. So uh, the goal was to use nanotechnology with principle of robotics and try to do something with it. So, uh, so I uh, tried to find the, uh, some application where it would be uh, a bit easier to, uh, to motivate the uh, grant uh, Know, a source of grant to, to give some money. And uh, so uh, I thought that using uh, nanotechnology, nanomedicine with the uh, principle of robotics could help in fighting cancer. So that's the, uh, what we're doing. So pretty much in the lab, if you come to our lab, you're going to see engineer, uh, computer programmer, you're going to see uh, uh, biologists, uh, um, uh, chemistry, uh, pharmaceutical uh, science, and uh, everything, imaging, processing, uh, everything's mixed up. And we work very closely with different medical groups, and we try to develop new technology to help uh, provide new tools for doctors to fight cancer. So that's, uh, and we believe that robotics can really help to uh, enhance the, the uh, therapeutic effect in cancer therapy. The, uh, the, uh, you're probably aware of the, uh, you see the, uh, from intrusive surgical, the Da Vinci robots. And those, uh, I was giving a few weeks ago in California, uh, some talk about the, uh, those engineers over there, uh, the uh, uh, Palo Alto in California. And the, uh, those people sell one platform like that for surgery, a robot, every day. So that means every day there's a new hospital or clinics that adopt this technology to do surgery. And the uh, robotics, we, we think robotics is the use of the industry uh, for industrial, you know, or different applications. But in the medical field, there's a big boost right now. And uh, so what we think in our, uh, in our group is that the next generation after surgery would be cancer, cancer therapy. We believe that the number of patients that could uh, take advantage of that, it's much higher than the surgery. Much higher. I'm going to show you some numbers later on. So when we talk about medical nanorobot, you see if you go on the website and you type nanorobot, you see those things with grabbing things like that. So the artistic view is to take a large model, a large robot, and shrink it down. And actually, it's not right because the force in the physics at the small scale is very different. So the design of those robots have to be very different. For instance, the Reynolds number, right? So if you use the ship and you reduce the size and you have a proper bird, because it looks more viscous, the fluid looks more viscous, it will not move. You need something to drill. That's what bacteria have flagella, uh, like uh, a chili wine opener, right? Uh, you, it's pretty much the same thing. So you have to drill your way there. So the physics is completely different. The force also is different, right? Gravity is not important. You got some molecular interaction. The magnetic magnetic field is different. If you have a three nanometers particle versus a larger object, completely different. Property is different. So. As engineer, what we do to solve problem, we only have this book, large book of physics law at the macro scale, and we try to apply that to uh, solve the uh, solve, solve problem. And what we're doing now with nanotechnology is the physics is completely different. So having a second book give you more equation, more physics phenomena, but you don't forget the large book. So we, we still work in the macro scale, but we're working on the nano scale also 
to provide more physical law that we can exploit it and give it more freedom, more uh, opportunity if you want to solve problem. Okay? So this is where nanotechnology comes. So the motivation, why cancer? This is just that stick for uh, USA, uh, US only. So they were an estimate that's in 2013, those are real numbers. There's 1,660,200 new cancer cases, and that result in 580 and 350 deaths, which is almost 1,600 people per day, or one every 50 per second. This is a million of dollars, right? They develop new molecules. They're working very hard. What is the problem? Biochemists, or well, pharmaceutical thing. They develop all those molecules. More effective the molecule is, more toxic it is, it go to the wrong location. They cannot bring it to the right location, right? And bringing something in the right location, like a robotics arm or something like that, that's what robotics does, right? So if you could take those very toxic things and bring it to the right location with sensors, actuators, and positioning, control, and so on, you can boost the therapeutic effect of those things and decrease the toxicity for the patient. There's a lot of patients, especially people getting older and older, so they cannot tolerate all the toxicity there of those drug molecules. Even there, we're talking to pharmaceutical company, and they have drugs molecules that will kill the tumor very effectively. The problem is it will kill the patient first. So those drugs molecules, they're on the shelf. Nobody can use it. They're right there. Nobody can use it because it goes everywhere. It will affect it. They're too toxic for the patient. So when you think that there's an estimate today's work population is 7.119 billion people there, and U.S. only 4.45%, and 80% of all those cancers in form of solid tumor in one location, and they don't have any technology to bring this thing in one location, this is where robotics can play a big role there. So you see that the surgery versus cancer is a huge market. And when you develop those kind of technology, you need to talk this language. Where's the motivation? Why would we going to invest money to this kind of technology? Right? So the fact right now is that currently pharmaceutical nanocarriers, so like liposome, micelle, polymer nanoparticle, those, those are carried and capsulated the drugs to deliver it because we cannot just deliver the drug like that. We need some kind of carrier and capsulate it. And it may have result very low tumor site accumulation. Now, they, they, they have the uh, NS primary retention effect that means the, the drug, the carrier gets stuck because the blood vessel gets too small. So it gets stuck there. Okay? That's, that's called what they call EPR effect. They use PEG. PEG is a molecule that increases circulation time. So it circulates longer you know, before being attacked by the defense system for the body. So the thing that right now the highest technology to use is that if you increase the circulation time, there's more probability that it will come close to the tumor, right? So there's no navigation, it just increases the stuff. So, but the number indicate that when you inject a drug, there's about 1% that get very close to the tumor. And with the PEG stuff, it's more circulation time, you go to 2%. In the best case, 2%. Only 2%. But for them, it's a big thing because you double the, the number of drugs that get there. But you have 98% that contribute to the uh, increase of toxicity for the patient. And that limits the type of drugs that you can use it. Now, the evolution of the cancer fighting bomb, pretty much. Okay? You start with grenade, doesn't do much. They increase the efficacy of, the, of these drug molecules. So you get the bomb over there. And now what they do is, they blow out the whole thing, the whole body. Okay, they go everywhere. Okay, and then you get one less than one percent that hit the target. So they just go everywhere, make sure that they get the target. But most of the explosion, the bomb, it destroy everything around. That's pretty much it. So now you have the choice: go to more toxic thing, we blow out everything, so you cannot do that to kill the patient. We'll go to more smart bomb with sensors and actuators and GPS system and those things like that. Right? This is the analogy here. So the three main limitations of actual chemotherapy when you inject the drugs there to go to uh, treat the cancer is systemic circulation. OK? 
Okay? Your body got close to 100,000 kilometers of blood vessel, or BP, 100,000 kilometers, okay? It's two and a half times the circumference of planet Earth at the equator. That's what you have. So when you go talk about systemic circulation, it's 100,000 kilometers close to that. That circulate, very toxic thing. So low therapeutic index is high toxic, systemic toxicity for the patient. So very often they cannot even treat the patient there. Lack of diffusion to penetrate deep into the tumor. There's a tumor interstitial fluid pressure. The tumor you cannot inject directly because it's a pressure. It will, like the volcano, will spread. And those cancer cells will spread and cause metastasis go everywhere. So you cannot do that. Okay? So there's a pressure here. And this pressure also prevents larger drug molecules to diffuse it because of the pressure. So you need some force to go inside. The other one, not able to target critical region inside the tumor. The tumor is not like a ball. You cannot do surgery because there's branching go everywhere. If they do surgery, they remove the big parts, but it's very dangerous for metastasis because then you break the, uh, you break the cell and the cell can escape and create other problems two, three years later. Very dangerous. And also there's branch there. And those tumor cells are very aggressive. They grow very fast. When we do the test, two days only, they double, triple population. They go very fast. Very, some type of tumor very aggressive. And the surgery cannot see this tiny branch stuff like that. It cannot get rid of the thing. Okay? And the, when I'm talking about the epoxic region, it's not homogeneous. It's very complex inside. And some part is called necrotic region, where the cancer cell is dead. If you deliver there, it will not do anything. And that's some part where the cancer cell, very aggressive, that's a source of metastasis. And those cells, so they, they, they develop very quickly, they consume oxygen. And this oxygen level is about 0.5% oxygen. That's the region you want to attack. That's where it's most aggressive. That's the, that, that's the thing. So the specific target inside the, uh, the tumor, the problem is the blind. There is no instrument that can detect where those epoxic regions are inside the tumor. Okay? So the current uh, main tumor targeting approach is passive targeting, where you inject your, your nanocarriers everywhere with the drugs, and you just circulate, and some small percentage, 1%, get stuck. And the other one has some molecules that will anchor. But to anchor, they have to come very close. So there's no navigation. They circulate very... Now randomly around it, and some get stuck at the place, stuff like that, and some will incur to the, to the tumor. So the fact since the more than 80% of the cancer that localized in the form of solid tumor, why going everywhere? It's called systemic circulation. Instead of delivering therapeutic using the most direct physical route, which is a non-systemic circulation, point A to point B, along the trajectory, right? So we call this thing new concept direct targeting where I said we go directly point A to B. So it's like a tree, very much, okay? So if you, if this is like the, the artery, uh, where the green thing, and go to the arteriole and then the capillaries, it's like a branching, same thing. Now, if you inject something very toxic, okay, very toxic, this tree will look like the tree right now in Montreal. There's no leaf, it looks dead. It's ready for the winter, okay? Pretty much all down right now. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to navigate it, and you want to affect only a small region, and not the whole body, pretty much. And ideally, you want to get to this red spot, the target, without affecting the rest of the tree, right? So this tree in the human body looks like that. Like I said, it's near 100,000 kilometers vascular root. It got a few millimeters with blood flow about one third of a meter per second, okay? 0 0.2 meter per second on average. Then you get down to the arterial. Arterial, 50 to 150 microns. This is my hair. The thickness of my hair. This is big. This is huge, the scale. Okay, now you have to reprogram the cell. This is huge. And past that, we don't see anything. We're completely blind. There's no imaging modality that can see the road. Completely blind. Okay? And then you get down to 4 to 8 micron. Okay? 4 to 8 micron. Like I said, your human hair is about. 800 micron human hair thickness. Okay, so you get to, so you have to navigate to those things. So artificial implementation. The thing where we're thinking about using magnet, right? That's what we've been using. 
And uh, if you put a magnet, this is a force on the uh, magnetic nanoparticle. And what I should point out, you cannot use permanent magnet. Why is that? Nano you use nanoparticles about 20 nanometers, which are super permanent magnetic. The reason is that if you put in a high field, it will become super magnet, even stronger than the best permanent magnet, right? And when you remove the patient from the magnetic field, they will lose the, all the magnetization. They're not magnet anymore. So they will not aggregate, because if they still magnetize all the time, they form big cluster, and the immune system cannot get rid of that, and there's a big medical complication. So we have to go with nanotechnology, nanoparticle, super paramagnetic, at about 20 nanometers. And the thing is, what they say is depend on the volume. Larger the, the, the nanoparticles are, or more aggregate, larger aggregate it is, more force you can have. But you limit by the size of the blood vessel, so you can have something, can have something very big. M is the magnetization. So if you put something in the high uniform field, magnetic field, they will magnetize it up to a saturation level. And that depends on the material. And the, uh, the last term is the gradient, the variation in the magnetic field. That's what's going to propel there. So it's pretty much, we put in a, a uniform field, it's like having an engine that, that turn, put in the gradient, that's the gas pedal, okay? And the gradient is a 3D with the wheel, and the M is the magnetization, it's a four cylinder, A, the 12 cylinder engine, the force that we have stuff. So. Okay, if we put an analogy there. The problem with the external magnet is that as you go a bit far from the magnet, the magnetic field strength decay. It decay. So you lose all the magnetization, so no force act on that. So it only work very close to the skin. So that is not good. And there's no navigation. Now, if you take a super paramagnetic nanoparticle iron oxide, which is used as contrast agent into magnetic readiness imaging system. As you see the curve there, the field in Tesla, when you get about 1.5 Tesla, they reach almost full saturation. That means that full saturation, any variation of the magnetic field will induce a maximum force on those particles, maximum force. So, so you need to put in a uniform field where they're not going to move, but they're going to be high magnet. And then you need to propose a, var a variation, 3D variation of the magnetic field. And the same nanoparticle can be used as contrast agent. So if you put into the MRI system the 1.5 Tesla, that means now that the particle anywhere into the body, doesn't matter at which step, is going to be fully saturated. And then you're using the imaging gradient of the MRI that they say to do the slice, and then you do the imaging because the contrast agent, they create a signal, you can see where it is, and then you can, after that you can, based on the position, you can induce a force using the same gradient, 3D gradient on the MRI scanner to do this. And then you do close loop like that. And what's nice about, about the MRI scanner is not the best resolution, but when you put a particle inside and with synthesize the right way, it amplifies the signal so many times. That means that you can detect particle down to about 15 micron, where the resolution, special resolution MRI is about 500 micron, where X-ray might be 100, 200 micron, but because you can detect smaller magnetic object with MRI. So now the MRI machine is not just to do imaging, or tracking is also actuators that you can uh, induce a force on in that. And then what we do, uh, we call this technique magnetic resonance navigation. So you have synchronization, propulsion, tracking, position, and you fold, and you you navigate along the track there. Okay. So the this technology. Because of material, there's never a good material enough, and also the technology, the green and coil, and the pants, and so on. I don't have time to go too much detail. 
is limited to about here, to about 50 micron, roughly. 50 micron, 500 micron, okay? Which is about the human hair thickness. The smaller device we can navigate it is about that, to have full control of that. Now you can use a different controller to do that. Okay, some example here: PID, self-addicted fuzzy controller, predictive base approach, nonlinear modeling, robust control server, adaptive backstepping control, and so on. Uh, you have to take into account the latency to get the feedback because it's not as fast as a camera, you know. So that's why you need to rely on predictive control and stuff, and the blood flow rate, stuff like that, processing, stuff like that. So it's some example here. It go very fast, about a fraction of a second to maximum two seconds to deliver drugs. But we need to repeat many times depending on the dose because you can because deeper you go, more the vessel uh, length it's small. So the so we send many particles. So we need to repeat it. So it's like a machine gun pretty much. So that's what it looks like. This is one millimeter is B, uh, B, so it's about the size of your, your pen over there. So you go to the now you go to three, three, go back. So this is real time. All my videos real time. Okay, it's not accelerated. So you see here, you you uh, you pinpoint the thing from a catheter, inject it, and the MRI take over. It, it do a close loop about 20 to 30 times per second. So there's no doctor. Doctor go take a coffee, come back. Okay, there's no involvement. He cannot make decision. There's too many variables. So you have to trust the computer. This is it. So he shoot like that, and you look at MRI. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, let's proceed next step. That's it. Okay? The thing's too fast, like, you now there's many decisions. Uh, one, two seconds, there's too many decisions. So the interface is like that. You put, uh, this is the character of tree of a, of a pig, okay? And this is a waypoint, you put a waypoint, thing like that, there's all kinds of software, uh, filtering, stuff like that. We can uh, superpose x-ray with MRI, of a better see the spinal cord in this case, to for registration, the mesh registration, different things. So, you can. So this, just this slide is about uh, two and a half years of work, so I'm going very fast. So uh, this is another example. This is the hepatic artery in the rabbit this time, okay? Uh, so this is the, uh, for the liver chemoabolization. And again, the same thing. Those are done with 50, those are the carrier that comes in, the doxorubicin, the nanoparticle. And you can see what's nice is they create artifact. It will stay there for about 24 to 48 hours. So the doctor can see in 3D where the drug is being delivered and, and roughly how much drug is being delivered. Okay. Now we have other, uh, other technology that you can increase the gradient, stuff like that, even more, 10 times more powerful. The problem is the doctor has to trust more the computer because it's much more complex mathematical model. So what we do, the field is homogeneous. Instead of relying on the core to do that, we get something even 10 times stronger than the coil to steer, okay? So it's even more powerful. But the problem is it cannot do the feedback control. So you have to, it shoot many things, and after that it can take a look. Uh, so during that time you have to trust more technology. And this is very hard to get the doctor to trust technology. This is harder than do this technology. Very, very hard. They're, they're not programmed to trust, you know, to trust computer. But this thing what we do is, from the blood vessel that you do imaging, the, the computer from a uh, from mathematical model calculate how to distort the field. It distort the field. That moving, using gradient, we're moving large sphere, chrome steel sphere, around it. And there's many of those. And then we distort the field so that when you inject full speed, it will follow a path to go directly there. Right? So, and this is very sensitive. This is an example over here. And uh, just a very basic encounter and stuff like that. So we didn't try yet on the animals model yet, this technology. So because it's not uh, reliable enough yet. But uh, we, it's getting there. This is probably about six months we're going to be, uh, be able to start the first in vivo test. So here, this is the, we call it as one dipole field navigation. So this is inside the MRI stuff like that, okay? So this is inside here, and this is how the carrier looks like. This is a smaller size here. That's a human here, broken. So this is big. This is big. This is considered big. No, 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 no. Very big. Okay. Now we need to go past that, and this is the before and after. 
the tumor, when it grow, at some point about one millimeter in size, the, it need oxygen and nutrient to grow more. And the molecule oxygen cannot diffuse. So what they do, they create blood vessel, angiogenesis. They grow it. And they connect to the blood vessel to bring nutrient and oxygen. And this is the same path that we have to go to kill the tumor. Same path, same thing. Okay? The problem is they're very tiny, very chaotic. You see how complex it is. Those are about four, six micron in size. And we cannot see where it is. Okay? We cannot see it. So in lower and also hydrodynamic stuff, when we saw now we change word, right? So there's, there's word that we done a catalytic motors like a like a small <coughs> rocket if you want, chemical sun if it, if it just shoot, stuff like that. And the uh, the scallop, bomb limitics, the scallop, stuff like that, you know. Uh, some other magnetic stuff and some artificial bacteria flagella that mimics the flagella, stuff like that. The problem with, the, with those technology is that since you don't see those small blood vessels, you cannot have an external computer to tell them how to get there, right? Because you don't see the road. So what you need is a Google car but very small, very small Google car. So you need more than locomotion, you need sensors. So it's pretty much to say, okay, I inject in uh, uh, Valparaiso, and we need to the cancer is in uh, Buenos Aires, okay? So I can point the direction, but I don't know the road. So you need something that it can stay on the road, not go outside the road, but we just point the direction, and if there's the uh, a turn like that, they can turn and they can, but always go to the right direction. You need something more autonomous with some sensors. That's why it's a, a bit like the Google's car. So we can only point it there, but we cannot tell them how to get there. Right? So, to do that, you need something uh, very sophisticated, more than locomotion. And this, I put a human here all the time for reference, okay? It cannot be larger than that. Because the blood vessel, if you want to leave the blood vessel to go inside the tumor, the leaky, the blood vessels are different. They have holes compared to other blood vessels. They're leaky. And those holes, the maximum diameter of those holes is 2 micron. So if you have anything larger than 2 micron, they will not be able to get there. So it's maximum size. This, we don't have a choice. This is the way it is. 2 micron, okay? Maximum size. This is 2 micron there, a small depth there. I have to fit everything up to fit there. Okay. Now, you need a proper link system that can go low Reynolds number, like this kind of artificial flagella or some cross or something that will work at that scale. Okay? Inside. Now you need a mortars because you cannot induce a force. You need to put a mortars. So already there is very challenging. Very challenging already, right? You need a mortar inside this. Now what do you need? You need obstacle detector. Because if it's passive, it gets there, and the road is there, then it's stuck there. You need to say, oh, there's something there, and start searching around and say, okay, I got this thing there. So I'm going there, right? So an obstacle detector connects to kind of computer, number of subscape as some kind of basic computer that can control the steering system, go around, go around obstacle, although I get stuck there. So you need a receiver navigation system, kind of GPS. Stuff, right? They tell them the direction, which with direction to go. But you don't want to follow the direction, just to guide them towards the direction, right? And this thing have to control the influence the control system, the steering system. Six, you need an oxygen sensors, right? Because I'm talking about the epoxic region. You want to go where the oxygen concentration go to high level of the blood vessel. And then you leave the blood vessels, you go to the what they call interstitial space, and you want to go where there are low oxygen concentration because this is where the tumor cell is very active. You want to deliver your, your cargo there, right there, right? So for that, since we cannot tell them, we don't know where they are. There's no way to visualize that. We need to rely on those type of robots to have enough oxygen sensors and say, oh, oxygen sensors is decreasing there and go right there to, you know, to sense it and go to this specific region inside the tumor. Okay? 
Now, you need a threshold detector, 0.5% oxygen detection, because if you go towards that and it continues, you go to necrotic zone. The tumor cell, they don't consume oxygen. I mean, there's no oxygen there. They're dead. So pretty much you deliver something, your drugs, in the place where the cancer is already dead. That's not good. So you want to you really have this threshold and say, okay, 0.5, you stop right there. Then you deliver your drug carbon right there. <coughs> you need a power source for that generator inside, right? And uh, if you're an electronic, you know that's very hard to induce uh, <laughs> with transformer or coil, stuff like that, the size. Everything has to be biocompatible. Everything biocompatible. All the material, everything. Okay? Now, you need to be able to carry maximum drug cargo, and those drugs have to be encapsulated like a uh, cargo ship, right? Put in container. Because you cannot expose the drug molecule directly there when you transport it to toxic. So you encapsulate it, and then it's released the right place. You need to attach that to the surface of that. Okay? Remind us right here. Okay? This is size. Okay. And extra specification. Because they're so small, they don't deliver a lot. So one will not do anything. So you need many of them. Okay? For that the centimeter tumor, you need uh, per injection, you probably need about 10 injections, which is injection for a couple of days because it's very hard for the patient, right? So you, each injection, you probably need about. Uh, close to 60 million adults. Now, if you have a, a student uh, building those things one by one, it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be able to do on time. It's not going to be cost effective to be very cheap. So what you're looking for is some type of um, um, self-replicating, if you want, that replicate itself, and you want something to drug that you mix it and then attach it. It's ready in 30 seconds, a few minutes, then you inject it, very soon, okay? So one potential solution, but it's a far, far future, and you understand that that's going to be very hard today to do, right? And people still dying very quickly right now, okay? Cancer is a very uh, big problem. So what we do, we go shopping in nature. So we, we found, we, we try to find a bacteria, because the bacteria are the right size, the right specification, that we could control it and use that as a robot, pretty much. And it's a, this bacteria is round in shape between one and two micron, maximum two micron inside, average 1.5 micron, so it's perfect. They swim 150 times their body length per second. It got the thrust force of about four to 4.7 picunewton of thrust, okay? And if you look carefully, there, so my student engineering said, yeah, but I don't know anything about biology. If you look carefully, it's a, they, they have the molecular motors, that rotor and stutter with ball bearing, except they're 300 nanometers in diameter. Okay? And they turn, actually, we can control their, their rotation. They turn anti-clockwise, they go forward. We can uh, reverse the molecular motor to go uh, clockwise to go backward, we can stop them, control uh, their speed, we can do anything we want with them, okay? We control like a real robot, okay? And this is really like, if you design something, the design of those molecular motors is exactly the same thing in the big electrical motors. We shrink it down. We flash it up because they're more effective than proper at lower enough at this, at this scale, right? Now, the physical pathway tumor, they're 4 microns, so you need something about 50%, otherwise you have the wall retarding effects, things like that. I don't, I don't have time to go too much detail. And touch cell space is the space between the cells, okay? They don't just go into blood, they so they go also between the cells. And the touch cell opening is less than 2 microns, okay? So if you want to get there, you have to be smaller than 2 microns. And bacteria, those bacteria, they're perfect size for them, okay? That's where it's okay. Now, this is human blood cell, okay? This is a robot over here. This is not this robot here. I could, I could tell the people this is a robot that will almost believe. So this is red blood cell, and this is a bacteria over here. And to control them, the, the, uh, to control them we need magnetic field slightly higher than what we have in this room. Slightly higher than that. 
That's much harder than that. So because of that, we don't have limitation. We can just go anywhere deep in the body. Now, again, my students say, OK, I didn't, I didn't take any biology course, stuff like that. I said, forget about it. I said, here's the bacteria. It's a propulsion system, oxygen sensor, the steering system. That's it. OK? That's all we need to know. And then we learn how to control it with computer. With computer program to control it. And that is before and after. This is the liposome. Liposome is a molecular bag, that's a container, containing in this case the SN38 molecules that is used for color cell, uh, treat color cell cancer in human. Okay? So we can put doxorubis in, we can replace liposome with other things, it doesn't matter. So here, other video there on the corner. So here's some things, the microfluidic chip over there, this is a red blood cell, and the white thing, is those are bacteria. So again, we use a magnetic field to, to control their direction, swimming direction, but the movement is done by their molecular mores, the flagella. There's no force involved to, to do that. So other example over here, those are all real time, okay? So you see about the speed, okay? okay? They're very, very fast. This is a swarm of those bacteria in the microfluidic channel. Okay? Okay, there's thousands of those bacteria right now. So, control. How we control them? There's some equation with, uh, you know, terminal energy and uh, applied field and so on. So, uh, those bacteria have, when we cultivate them, they're magnetotactic. So, they have a chain of nanoparticle, a single magnetic domain with the membrane, so to get some dipole interaction, make it very sensitive. So it's like a compass needle, pretty much, like a compass needle. And then with a, a weak magnetic uh, directional uh, field, uh, we can induce a torque, so we can drive it, stuff like that. So the thing is, it's very difficult to get money for that because it says you're crazy, you want to inject bacteria with drugs and things, that's not a good idea, you know that. And then it's how much control you have and things, so we have to do things that's not related to the medical field, but we have to show, to convince it, and that, that takes years, you know, that takes years to do. And this, we put that on YouTube, like pyramid and bacteria, you see that on YouTube, so we put on YouTube and the, uh, so this is real time. So it's 5,000 bacteria that controlled by computer that build a pyramid. So we build a pyramid because it's one of the first pyramids built by humans. So it's a 5,000 because they, they said they were 5,000 slaves. So we put 5,000. I don't know if they're all the bacteria working hard in this case. And this is real thing. And this is the uh, this is accelerate here. Okay, this accelerate. So this is just to show that if we can build a pyramid, then we can deliver drugs to the tumor. But this is pretty really easy. It's under a microscope and a drop of water. This is a drop of water with each box about the human ear thickness, the length of the block. Okay? So this is under a microscope and easy. But if you talk about the tumor, inside the tumor is like that. You got the epoxic zone, the necrotic, angiogenic, a lot of blood vessel, and the primate. We don't see that. We don't see that. We're blind. Now we cannot tell, like we build a pyramid, we cannot tell exactly what to do, where to go. So instead, what we do is we go from this thing on the left, which is deterministic approach. We they do exactly micron accuracy, exactly what we tell them to do. To now, we have to make more decision. We work together now. Now I said I want you to go there. Once you're there, you you make some decision. So I have some obstacle. I want you to go this direction, but I don't know where the obstacle is. I want you to take some decision, some autonomy and go around the optical to reach this position over there, okay? Because I don't see it. And, and that's what here, okay? This is the, an example here where you indicate the direction is the a small channel with a large obstacle. So instead of controlling each of those robots, if you want, to go there, we just tell them which, which direction to go. And what's interesting here is that if you have a large enough population, you've got some kind of swarm interaction some interaction between the bacteria. So as soon as one bacteria finds the path, the, the, the next bacteria is close enough to be influenced that influence the other one and so on. If you don't have enough, they're too far away, one finds the path, the other one doesn't know about it. But since we have about 60 million 
of those bacteria they inject. So we have a large population, so we have the, this interaction between the bacteria and the targeting become very effective. Now, like I said, this bacteria in nature, they, leave, they, they don't like oxygen too much. They're microiophilic. So they like, like to live in a place with about low oxygen concentration. But for them, the, the, the gravity doesn't influence them. So they use the geomasic field, like the north atmosphere, or south atmosphere. Here there will be, uh, in the south, south of the uh, equator, they will, go, they will be south-seeking. Where in, in Canada, U.S., it would be north seeking. They go toward the north. And this is the magnetic field point down, right? So here they use the magnetic field to do a one-axis search. Otherwise, they will not survive it. And they go down. The, the rotary motor go anti-clockwise. And then they have the oxygen sensors that... Works and when they detect the 0.5% oxygen, they reverse their rotor motors, they go back and forth, and then they form population of those bacteria. Then those bacteria at the 0.5% oxygen because that's what they like. And the 0.5% oxygen that they like correspond exactly to the oxygen concentration in the apoxic region of, of tumor in humans. Okay? So now what we have to do is we just have to develop a system that will simulate an environment where they will migrate to the epoxic region, but this epoxic region, this low oxygen concentration of 0.5% oxygen would be in this tumor. Okay? So we force them to migrate toward the tumor. This is how the system a bit looks like. Okay? So what we do is we separate the magnetotaxis from iotaxis. It's called magnetoiotaxis. So we use the, the magnetic field first to go towards the tumor. Inside the tumor, we switch to iotaxis, where now we expand their oxygen sensors to find the epoxic zone. Okay? And this is a platform uh, in the yellow uh, square over there. So this is a prototype because before we, now right now we're building a human scale, stuff like that, working with doctors, stuff like that, to uh, try to uh, implement that in clinics. But first, uh, to do that, we need to do uh, smaller animals. And this is how the system prototype looks like, okay? It's much smaller. There's a lot of mathematics, stuff like that, to create this magnetic pole and right location, thing like that, with sequence. I don't have time to, do, to go into too much detail. So pretty much is you create the surgeon on the computer thing from the MRI image. You got the uh, location of the tumor. And then you put the, uh, uh, what they call aggregation zone. This is the white circle you see there. Outside this white circle, the magnetic field is strong enough to have this uh, magnetic to influence the bacteria. Magnetotaxis. So create a, uh, a torque on this chain of nanoparticles which is synthesized during perturbation of those bacteria. So when they get into the circle, the, the field is too weak. So now the, there's not enough induced directional uh, torque on this chain of nanoparticles inside the bacteria. The bacteria doesn't know what to do, so now it's switched to aerotaxis, where it's looking for the 0.5% oxygen, one inside the tumor. So the first part, magnetotaxis, this is real time, okay? Go to the tumor, I don't know if you see well. Each, each dot, but there's many of those, there's thousands here. So this is real time, go very fast. They go very, very fast, okay? So they go inside the tumor. And once inside the tumor, then we don't know where the aerotaxis is. This is the, just under the microscope, a drop of water. And the, uh, so now the, there's no magnetic field, so now they go aerotaxis. The, the ring is where the 0.5% oxygen is. And now they, they grow because they consume oxygen as the, as the, in the drop of water, okay? So now we have the, the switch taxes. So we use the environmental there, the oxygen stuff. So we, we start with one, Use a magnetic field to influence the movement of those bacteria, and then we rely automatically just on the bacteria autonomously to find the oxygen concentration using their internal sensors. Loading capacity, they're very strong. So here, you see the big, the, the, the small dots, the bacteria, and the big thing is the load. So very big, very big. So very, very strong. 
So we have to do that to convince that if they can move this bullet by himself, one bacteria, then they can easily carry those small nanometer size that carry around the body, right? So to attach the self-assembly, so it's a biochemistry there, so you get the molecule attached, you, you mix it, and about in a few minutes it's ready to go. So it's all attached. We got about 70 of those bags per bacteria. It's pretty much uh, the maximum we can attach. Each one's about 170 nanometers. To have the application, this is pathology stuff. This is a tumor, and what the green because we use fluorescent. It shows that it's confirmed by pathology. That's the, that's the epoxic zone stuff like that. So this is confirmed in the tumor that it goes in the right location. And this is here, it's, it, it's kind of interesting. So if you use something the same size of bacteria, you inject very close. You see here, at the surface, you have a lot of those beads. As you because of the pressure, the, uh, the tumor pressure, they don't diffuse it. They don't go there. But because the bacteria got those molecular mores, they can go against the pressure. You can see here, it's, it goes deeper in the tumor. Here's the, the 300 microns and 250, 400 microns start population going up. But the epoxic zone, they locate further away from the blood vessel where the intestinal pressure is. And this other example over here. So the profile there, as they, you know, they cut the tumor there, and you can see that depending where the epoxic zone is located. Okay? So now we have this thing that, that we want to do. All this thing here, that's their ideal robot, that minimum functionality they need to enhance, to maximize the therapeutic effect by delivering exactly to the right location inside the tumor and with actuation sensors and the kind of GPS system, stuff like that. So that's what you see right here, down here, okay? That's exactly that. All the function is implemented there. Self-assembly, uh, everything, okay? So it's diagnostic application. If you put contrast agent, you look at MRI system, now you can see those epoxic zones. Right? So those are epoxic zones on the top there. This is injection. When you treat cancer, you inject very close to the tumor. That's what happened. Your drug is right there, and you want to go there. That's why the two, three years later, they control the size to grow the tumor, and then, up, oh, cancer reappear. They test that somewhere else or something like that. Right? Here you got the same, this is the bacteria with nanoparticle that it detect with MRI, clinical MRI system. And you see it go very deep inside, and those regions correspond to the epoxic region. So it's confirmed by pathology. Okay? So that's the difference there. So it has about 50 tests, bacteria. It's not safe to inject to the patient. Okay? Uh, if we inject 60 million bacteria, stuff like that, well, when you kiss your girlfriend or uh, vice versa, you will change 80 million, 80 million bacteria, you will change. So now you inject 60 million, so you have to, you know, just change your mind, <laughs> okay? Small size, big number, doesn't matter, okay? This is nothing, 60 million. But now you inject inside, so we still have to do safety tests. So we did a lot of safety tests. The problem is, as we go towards human application, the safety test costs more and more, and not, now we have a problem. We find money to go more, uh, more tests. But it already showed that it's those bacteria that are very safe. They're not pathogen. They will live about 30 minutes in human body, then they disappear completely. Okay? So that was very important to be able to continue those, those tests because they're very expensive. But we still have more tests to do to confirm 100% that it will be safe for you. So biology and technology, I'm going to finish it. So biology is good, technology is good, but each one has advantage, it's advantage. Those bacteria, if you inject, uh, it's good if you inject peritumoral, maybe very close to the tumor. It's good for colorectal, it's good for prostate, and some other type of cancer, but some other type of cancer, they're too deep, they're very hard to be able to inject very close. So now you need to be able to deliver those bacteria somewhere. That's what technology comes, right? So we can, it's hard, it's, it's, it's kind of try to go to the moon and try to build one vehicle to do that. So you ask NASA to build one type of vehicle to go from heart to the moon. The environment is completely different. So you need some vehicle to lift from the gravitational force of planet Earth, go from planet Earth to the moon, 
land to the moon and explore the moon. So it's a different vehicle there. It's very complicated, right? So here, the, the environment at the inside the tumor or the microvascular, so it's completely different from the artery stuff. Now, so the, the bacteria is good to the right of this blue line, where technology is good to the left, okay? So we need to combine both. And for that, we encapsulate in special summary for bacteria, pretty much. So we have those carriers go to about 50 micron, 150 micron, about the human hair the thickness in size. We encapsulate the bacteria with nanoparticles, okay? So, and then we use the MRI standard to propel them, and then we go to second phase where the bacteria do the rest, right? So this is the whole idea, right? This whole idea, it's fantastic way, same thing. So the driver is the bacteria, and, the, uh, and then we have some kind of summary to do that. And this is the summary over here, but it's not final. We're still working on that. So it looks easy, but it's very hard. This is a one passenger, okay, one passenger that's not good. So we have many passenger one, okay? So this is a bacteria inside this uh, kind of submarine there that can be navigated in the arteries there, okay? And we send thousands of those at a time, okay? Now we have, you see there's two population of bacteria, right? Okay, there's two population at the bottom there. Because we can program those bacteria just by a fraction of a second, we can program it to go toward the North Pole or to the South Pole. We can switch very easy, okay? So we can program it. So this is another uh, picture of the uh, slow motion there. See the bacteria is still alive inside there. Yeah. Okay. Now, we can go anywhere, 100,000 kilometers, stuff like that. There's one place very hard to get, it's the brain. Right? Because the blood bank artery. They prevent all the drugs to go there. So you need a way to open the door and go, go in the brain. Right? Okay? So, what's interesting is the same nanoparticle they use as a contrast agent to locate the position of those carrier robot, if you want, right? In the same nanoparticle, this propionate is 20 nanometers is very important, 20 nanometers of iron oxide. The same nanoparticle is used as a motor to propel it and steer those those carrier can also be used to open the blood vapor, okay? And uh, something we published a few months ago in the journal control release. So, once there, you use the same nanoparticle, and then you modulate the field. You modulate it for about 100,000 times per second. After a while, it will increase slightly the temperature, a few degrees, two, three degrees. That will cause a kind of mechanical stress, very local, where exactly where the drug is, because this is where the carrier is. And that will open by expansion, and the, uh, open the blood river for about uh, an hour and a half, two hours, and then it will reverse and come back, okay? So the same particle, and that's what you see here. The, the, the control means we didn't inject anything, okay? This is a rat brain, and the other one is no more term, I mean the same temperature, so you can see the black is those particles there, into the blood vessel over there. They don't diffuse, it's the, they cannot get into the brain, right? Now, if you use hypertermia, I mean you have the same carrier that in blood cell, and you modulate this thing, increase slightly the temperature, and then you open the blood vapor, and this is the blue dye, kind of blue dye. That's a, it's it's a simulated large molecule, very large molecule. And this large molecule can penetrate inside. Okay? And then we put recovery. So after a time, maybe two hours, two and a half hours. We, we, we do the same thing, and now it doesn't get inside the middle brain, it closes again, back to normal. So you open for a couple hours, the time to deliver the drugs, and it closes again, so like that, right? That's what we see here, okay? And this is a system over there. So the, the MRI, the magnetotaxic system for bacteria, and the, uh, and the thing for the brain. And between you got the kind, it's not exactly like that, it looks like. With a patient, where the doctor is there and they want to deliver something, computer decide which platform and when it's going to be used, and the patient is moving from one platform to the other one automatically, right? Everything's automatic here, okay? This is under construction, so it's going to be operational in about a year, okay? okay? And uh, where the doctor, we're training doctors to stop at that on this day. But before you get to humans, it's going to take a bit more time. I always take more time for humans. You have to do a lot of animal tests. 
So I'm going to conclude. Soon. So other initiatives on the way, improving again to swamp behavior. I talk about this. We have a large colony of those bacteria stuff. The targeting increased after that, so there's a lot of opportunity there to try to exploit swarm behavior. Like that. Attaching endotherapeutic, hydrosynthesis to improve endotherapy. Hydrotherapy is not effective with low oxygen. Since they go low oxygen, you put some gold nanoparticles or something like that, it will enhance the therapeutic effect. Because right now they need to inject uh, a beam, a very uh, ionizing beam, not X ray stuff that destroy all the tissue, very invasive. A lot of people die, and the ones that survive want to die because they end up with plastic bags, they, they don't have a normal life. No, very, very bad, very invasive. So if you could have reduced exerciser using those bacteria go exactly with low oxygen concentration where it's not effective because of lack of oxygen and after the IP, then you could reduce it as to be less invasive and better quality of life for the people after that survive. Genetics, that's what we're starting right now. So we identify the gene responsible for those nanoparticles that we can direct with the nanoparticles. That means that at some point, that's going to take a few years, but we're going towards that. At some point, we could implement that other microorganisms. We have other type of sensors, other characteristics would be better for some other application. And we could modify those microorganisms. And uh, so it would be a way to design. You know, engineer, engineer would work like, uh, instead of plastic, metallic part, work with genetics and design those robots through genetics, through the genes stuff, and have some copyrighted design stuff like that. That's what we're getting at with technology stuff like that. So if you study hard enough in here, you're going to study harder, we can have more course if you want to keep track of what's going on there. So that's what I use of it. So embedding living technology, we think robotics have to be plastic, metallics, things like that, but actually biology have a lot of components that you can integrate also with the plastic and metallic parts to give you more range, more opportunity to do this robotic stuff like that. Because we said robotics have to be plastic and metallics. Can be anything, right? Can be sensors. Can be you can exploit. You know those sensors. Uh, it doesn't have to be from the microchip stuff like that. Can be from biology, and then you link to the computer stuff like that. It doesn't matter if you have the information. That's good enough, right? So I'm not alone there. Okay. So just like I said, this is uh, so far 14 years of hard work, seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a, a day. Uh, a lot of people working very hard. We we'll collaborate with a lot of people. So we're in the lab. We're like, we're, we're the central. We work with coordinating like that. We try to see all the expertise as we as we can because it's getting more and more complex, and we need more and more expertise. And what's important is everybody different discipline work together towards a single goal. That's what's important there. Okay. We try to resolve something. I'm electrical engineering initially. When I was at MIT, I did 10 years in mechanical engineering. Now I'm in computer engineering. It doesn't matter. I, I, I realize I don't know enough to do all those things. So we need to collaborate with a lot of people. Something like that, right? I'm still right. <laughs> it's no end to that. So thank you very much. Sir.